Lustig. Hi and welcome to Wine Decoded. My name's Paul Kahn and I'm the Chief Wine Hacker here at Wine Decoded. Today we're moving into part two of the Wine Decoded Tasting Revolution. As we mentioned before, it's not so much of a revolution, it's a bit more about going back to basics. So if you've missed part one, we suggest you head down to the link further down in the page, click on that, head back and give that a watch before you kick into this one. It's a really good lead into today and will help you get your head around what we're doing today, which is all about balance and complexity. So last session we talked about the importance of tasting wine in context and contrast. That is having at least two wines to taste at a time and how that makes it so much easier for you to compare and then contrast one wine from the other. Look at one and say, hey, that one's a bit sweeter or that one's a bit fruitier or that one's a bit oakier or that one's a bit more sour or a bit more acid. That one's got a bit more alcohol in it. It's something that's really hard to do with a wine that's standalone. And until you've created a little bit of a central reference in your head about all of the different facets that are important in wine, it really helps and, and even helps pros to get their head around a wine by having something to compare next to it. So we'll be doing that again today. Last session we also talked about the importance of a wine having good depth and length so that the aroma and the flavour on the wine has good intensity and goes all the way from the front of your nose to the back and lingers around. It persists for a while and the same thing with the flavour. It goes all the way from the tip of your tongue to the back of your, your palate and lingers for a while. So what we're going to be doing today is pushing on and we're going to be talking about balance in wine first and then a little later complexity. We'll be tasting wine as we go and in our last session we talked about some things that you'll need. You'll need a good bottle of dry wine. We've got a white. Whites are easier to do this exercise with but if you want to do it with a red as well you can repeat the same exercise with a red wine just as easily and it's good to do that because it gives you a bit of an idea of how the two vary doing the kind of exercise we're about to do. You will also need a little bit of sugar. Just your standard white table sugar. Hopefully you can see that in there. Um, you don't want brown sugar, we're not looking to impart any sort of flavours or aromas, just a, a really neutral sugar. We also have a little bit of tartaric acid here. So tartaric acid is the main acid in wine grapes, the natural acid in wine grapes, and it's also added to a lot of wines, particularly in warmer climates where wines don't have enough acid to be in balance. So we've got a little bit of tartaric acid here, we're only going to need a tiny, tiny bit of it. If you don't have tartaric acid, you can use citric acid, which you can more easily get from the supermarket or a baking store, but tartaric acid is possible to get as well quite relatively easily. You will also need a bit of Rasputin's finest, uh, a little bit of vodka. Uh, and we're only gonna need about 10 mils. Uh, so as long as you've got a tiny bit, you're in, uh, you're in clover. Um, now, what we're going to do is quickly prepare four wines. We're going to have a control, a wine with a little extra sugar in it, a wine with a little ac extra acid in it, and a wine with a little extra alcohol in it. The first wine, the control, should be roughly in balance, and the other four will be respectively too sweet, too sour, or too alcoholic. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how each of those play together. So first of all, pour a decent amount of wine in a glass, 75 to 100 ml, something like that. This is probably closer to 75. Um, they don't have to be exactly the same. You just need a bit to allow you to go back and forward and try each wine against each other at various times. Um, so there we go. That bit is done. Wine sorted. Next, you've got control, put that aside. Next glass, we want to put some extra sugar in. In this case, we're going to add about half a teaspoon of extra sugar. So, I don't know if you can see that, but yay much. Chuck that in. Start giving it a bit of a mix. It'll take a little while to dissolve, so we'll be doing a bit of stirring while we're doing this. So I'll just get that going with a quick stir. Let the wine start to dissolve it naturally. Sugar, done. Next bit, some acid. 
just about a quarter of a teaspoon. Don't need very much of this. Try and get it on a black, black background. There you go. So we put that in our third glass. And start giving that a little bit of a stir. Happy days. So we've got uh, ingredients in the first two that are being changed. Then we're going to need roughly a capful, sort of five to ten millish, uh, close to ten of vodka going into, whoop, generous pour at the bar today, uh, into the final glass. So that gives us our four different wines that we're going to try today. And we'll just get those dissolved. The acid's getting close and the sugar's getting close. It will dissolve. While we're getting it to dissolve, I'll let you know about a couple of things here. What we're doing is exactly what you do if you were doing a winemaking degree or a sensory evaluation course. You would look at simple wines, sometimes just water, that had sugar added to it, acid added to it at different levels. Um, the levels would actually be a little lower uh, so we're making this quite obvious uh, because it's, it's not important to try and trick people in this exercise. It's, in try and, it's important for you to get your head around uh, balance in an easy way. So sugar's almost dissolved. Acid's pretty much there. Get rid of those spoons. Give that sugar another little bit of stir. So in terms of those levels, what we're talking about um, in, in, uh, in hardcore wine tasting would be often trying to work out your sensory threshold. So you'd be tasting in the realm of half a gram per litre, one gram per litre, two grams per litre of sugar in wine compared to the roughly 50 that's in this glass, uh, 50 grams per litre. So a dry wine is around two grams per litre sugar. That's all the sugar that's left after the yeast can't ferment anymore. In terms of the acidity here, we've got roughly three times the amount of acid that you would see in a typical wine in this glass. Now, it's going to be puckering, but it's not harmful at all. Don't worry about that. There'd be more acid in Coke. Uh, and in the last wine, give it another swell. We've got the alcohol, as we said. So let's kick off. Tasting the same as last time, what we want you to do is taste the control. Here's the, the first wine. We've used the same wine as we did last time, which is gonna sort of make it a little easier for us again because we're familiar with that wine. We want you to give it a good sniff. We want you to take a decent mouthful in. Don't be tight. Give it a good swirl around and just try and get a picture of that wine in your head and, and have a look at the balance in that wine. Nothing in particular should be sticking out. A balanced wine will be harmonious and neither the fruit the sugar, the acid, the alcohol, the tannin, or the oak should be sticking out. So let's have a look at this one and have a, a good deep smell. Take your time, concentrate on the way it tastes in your mouth and the textures in your mouth. Again, look, this wine is well balanced. It's got good acidity, it's dry, it's got sweetness from the fruit but not sweetness from any sugar in there. The alcohol is in balance. There's not really any tannin, mega tannin structure or oak to be considered uh, but everything seems in, in pretty good balance here. Now really try and lock away what that wine tasted like in particular in your head and we'll go on and we'll taste the next wine. So the second wine here has the extra sugar in it. So what you want to look at is how the flavour has changed, how the texture might have changed, and in particular with this wine, how the finish of the wine has changed. So good sniff, good mouthful, swell it around. Um, I'm spitting today because this ain't so much fun to drink, but a great exercise in understanding balance. So here we go. So for me, immediately, the wine seems, yes, 
sweet, incredibly sweet. It's become a little clumsier on the palate. It's not refreshing to drink, particularly that front mid palate. And then when you swallow the wine, it's almost just a little bit cloying. So cloying is a term, it's sort of like when you've had a spoonful of honey and that sort of, that sugar's taken a while to go down. It just doesn't finish like a, a clean, refreshing drink of water after, you know, a hot day's work somewhere. So very different to that first wine that was in balance. If you want to, you can now go back to that first wine, having had a little bit of a rest and compare it and see how it's going to be hopefully lovely, winey, refreshy uh, and balanced. Let's have another quick look at that. Now it's important to swallow a little bit of these wines as you go because that gives you a full effect of how the balance has changed. Going back to that first wine, you see it is balanced. It is refreshing. It's crisp. It finishes clean. There's not that cloying factor of having too much sugar in there and being out of balance with that sugar. Let's go now and try the third wine. This is the wine that we added the little bit of extra acid to. Now again, you're gonna be expecting exactly what you expect with acid in wine. Think lemon juice in water, okay? So that's what you're gonna be expecting, a certain degree of sourness. But let's see just how much is in there. So, immediately, Mouth puckering. Saliva is literally dripping down the sides of my mouth at the moment with the acidity in that wine. It is clearly out of balance. When you taste the wine now, the fruit doesn't really get a chance to shine through because all you're seeing is acid and sourness. And that sourness adds a certain textural chalkiness, which the chalkiness bit I don't mind as much, but the, the extreme sourness is, is frankly unpleasant. It makes the wine mean and lean and just not really a pleasant drink. Go back to the first wine now, have a look at it and see how the balance exists. So our control, nothing added to it. Again. Looks good, looks balanced. It has lovely fruit, lovely wininess, a lovely fresh crisp nature to it. Beautiful wine. Let's go to the last wine and have a look at how alcohol impacts it. Now, there's a fair chance that you're gonna be able to smell the alcohol when you smell this wine. There will be a little bit of a lift from alcohol. You'll also have an impact on the texture of the wine. And notice how it impacts the palate of the wine and the feeling in your mouth as it goes from the front of the, to the back of your palate. Okay, so have a go. Let's have a sniff. Actually, now that you've sniffed this one, go back to the control and just sniff it. See the difference? Go back to the one with the extra alcohol added to it. You're seeing just an edge of lift and an edge of something kind of volatile that's hitting the back of your nose and that is alcohol, right? So we've noticed our first impact of there being more alcohol in this wine. The fruit is less obvious in the wine with the alcohol added to it and you've got that slightly volatile alcohol lift coming through. Okay, let's have a proper taste of it this time. Okay, now, if you've got a picture of the control in your head and you think back to it, what I'm picking up is almost 
an oily mid palate. All right, the fruit seems to be a little bit subdued in the wine. It has been slightly diluted, but not that much. And as you swallow the wine, there's a hit of alcohol and hardness, and a hardness to that alcohol and, and some heat that comes through at the back of your palate. If you're uncertain about that, go back to the control. Remember, this is what we talked about tasting with context and in contrast. The context today being we're looking for balance in wine and the contrast being that we've got to control when we're too much sugar, too much acid, too much alcohol. Go back and taste the first one now. There you go. Roughly balanced wine versus one that has too much alcohol. If you're uncertain, come back to this one with alcohol. Have another taste. Same thing. I can see that it's out of balance. It's created that slightly oily texture in the mid palate. Alcohol at this kind of level gives the wine a little bit of a sweetness as well. And you've seen that angularity and the hardness and the heat come through at the back of your palate. If it's not obvious enough for you, just add another cap of alcohol, another cap of vodka, and that'll really show it. So there we go. We've had a look at balance uh, at a basic level, having a look at a control, a wine that's too sweet, a wine that's too acidic or sour, and a wine that's got too much alcohol in it. What I'd like to briefly talk about now is the balance between these. So some of these things play off against each other. So you've got a control here, which hasn't had any sugar added to it. Here's a chance for you to play winemaker and be a little bit of a, a sort of a wine chemist and particularly uh, see the, the difference when you add a little bit of sugar and then a little extra acid to a wine. So quite often with a wine uh, when you're finishing a wine, and particularly in a very large winery, you'll look at some minor, minor adjustments to that wine with, say in the case of white wine, a little bit of extra acid. Now, we added what would be equivalent to about 15 to 20 grams per liter of acid to this wine. That's extreme. What we're talking about is adding an eighth or a quarter of a gram per liter of acid to a uh, to a wine to just give it some freshness it brightens up the fruit and give it that nice clean finish if it if it needs it now it may not need it and you may not even indeed be able to perceive avert acid but you might perceive a better balanced wine and a fresher wine so here's your chance to have a look and take the control start by simply adding a little bit of the wine with a with some extra sugar in it not too much just a splash have another taste. You can see. You can see that sugar's been added. It looks a little bit flatter. It's not finishing as clear as the wine when it was unadulterated. Get yourself another glass and have a control if you need to. Now have a look at it. Take the wine with a bit of extra acid in it and just put a tiny splash in, give it a mix, and <laughs> it's largely come back into balance. All right, so what we now have, instead of a dry wine, we've got an off dry wine, just with a little extra acid in it, and it's come into balance. This is giving you a bit of an idea about how sugar and acid interplay. Think of the great German Rieslings, think of the Saturns of the world, where you've got potentially quite a lot of sugar, but also enough acid to balance it out and to keep it fresh, vibrant, and clean. Importantly, those wines still have, in balance, a lovely core of fruit. The fruit is still there. You're not just relying on sugar and acid to make a tricked up wine. You've actually got a wine that has a lovely core of fruit and in balance with it, some sugar and some acid. So this happens across a diverse array of, of wine styles. 
If you want to think about the most complex one, I would say you're talking about something like a vintage port where you're balancing sugar, acid, alcohol, tannin, potentially some oak, but typically it's old oak, and a lovely core of fruit. All of those things combined in the right amounts for that particular wine will give it lovely balance. In those vintage ports, you see quite a lot of structure, quite a lot of tannin. You see searing acidity, but it's balanced out by incredibly concentrated fruit, a good squash of sugar, and a fair bit of alcohol. And the wine comes together and is harmonious and nothing sticks out. So that's the big trick at the end of the day. You're looking for a wine where nothing sticks out. So there you go, that's a quick guide to balance. We're gonna talk about this throughout all of the wine bite sessions that we do where we record and taste wine in context and contrast and share it with wines that you can buy. And, and now we wanna quickly go on and talk about complexity. In this instance, we're not gonna taste something. I'm just gonna give you a, a, a brief rundown of complexity and we'll point it out when we come to different wines as we're going through it and doing wine bites and tasting wine together in the future. So Jeff Weaver, who's a bit of a legend of the, the Aussie wine industry, talks about it and talks about complexity being when the whole orchestra is playing rather than just one instrument. And that's a great analogy. There's a beautiful piece of music further down in the, uh, in the post that you can listen to that gives you an idea of simplicity versus complexity. Although the simplicity in that is quite beautiful as well. But the other great way of talking about this is to talk about uh, cooking. And when you're cooking a dish, now let's say you're cooking something like a boeuf bourguignon. Right, so if you just had beef in it and that was it, it would be pretty boring. If you started to layer in different flavours by adding different ingredients, so there'll be the herbs that you add, there'll be a, a mirepoix with carrots and celery and onion, that you'll caramelize off. There'll be obviously a lot of red wine in there. Um, there'll be sugar, there'll be uh, pepper. You'll flambe off the, the seared off beef with some cognac or some brandy. All of those things will start to add different characters and different levels of com complexity. You'll finish the dish off with a bit of butter. Um, again, continuing to build and add complexity. You'll cook it for a while and you'll get caramelization effects that will add complexity. So that's what you're looking for in wine in terms of complexity as well. If you've got a simple wine, it's kind of boring. It's just kind of like having the beef uh, from the, uh, the Boeuf Bourguignon by itself raw, as opposed to having the full dish, which has been cooked for a long time and is just delicious. So, there we have it. We've talked about today balance and complexity. Um, balance is important because a wine becomes disjointed and is not harmonious and will be unpleasant to drink because something will be out of whack. Complexity is important because without it, your wine is simple. It's kind of boring. Um, so think about those factors along with length and depth when you're tasting wines. So now we've cut off two things that you need to look at when you're tasting wine, that length and depth, and also that balance and complexity. Remember these wine bites will always be here for you. You can come back and do the exercise again. You can tighten it up and add less sugar and less acid, less alcohol. You can play around mixing things up. You can do it with red wine as well. So please leave us a comment and let us know what you thought. You might remember uh, from the first session that we pre prepared a couple of bottles of wine, one full to the brim and one half full. We'll need those for our next session where we discuss freshness and development. So make sure you bring those along. If you haven't prepared those already, 
prepare them now. The instructions are in the first video. We demonstrated how to do it. Quite easy, just a couple of bottles, a little bit of wine. Um, all the details are on this page and also in the video from the first part of the Wine Decoder Tasting Revolution. So grab those and um, have them ready for ne next session. Thanks again for joining us. Please again, leave a comment at the bottom of the page. Let us know what you thought. Let us know if you've got any questions. Um, we'll get back to you on those and give you an answer either in the next session or at the bottom of the page. And join us for part three when we discuss freshness and development. Thanks and bye for now from Paul. Cheers.